This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 24, Elementary Matrices and Inverses. Our objectives for this lecture are to compute the product of an elementary matrix and another matrix, and given an invertible matrix A, use the row reduction algorithm to compute A inverse. First, let's recall our row operations from lecture four. We have the scaling operation where we multiply a row by a non-zero constant, replacement where we replace a row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row, and swapping where we swap the positions of two rows. In this lecture, we're going to be talking a lot about elementary matrices. So what an elementary matrix is, is the result of taking one of those three row operations and applying it to the n by n identity matrix. So for example, this matrix E1 is an elementary matrix, can we identify which row operation we did, starting with the 3x3 three three identity matrix, that resulted in this matrix E1? Well, thinking about it for a bit, hopefully you'll see that what we did is a replacement operation. We replaced row 3 by row 3 plus 3 times row 1. Remember that what we're asking for here is not what row operation would we need to do to get this to go back to being the identity matrix. We're trying to reconstruct what row operation did we do to get this matrix starting with the identity matrix. Here's another example. So again, we've started with the identity matrix and we've resulted in this elementary matrix E2. What row operation did we do? Well, again, thinking for a bit, hopefully you'll see that what we did was we swapped row one and row two. One more example here. So we have an elementary matrix I'm calling E3. What row operation did we do? We started with the three by three identity matrix and we resulted in this matrix E3. What did we do to get there? Well, again, thinking about it for a bit and thinking about our three options, hopefully you see that what we did is we scaled row two by a factor of negative four. So how does this relate to matrix inverses that we were talking about in the previous lecture? Well, when we multiply an n by n matrix A by an elementary matrix E, that product E times A turns out to be the result of applying that row operation to the matrix A. And since our row operations are reversible, elementary matrices are invertible. And as we're going to see, the invertibility of elementary matrices is going to turn out to tell us when a general n by n matrix is invertible. But first, let's illustrate why it is that when we multiply an elementary matrix by a general n by n matrix, that we get the result of applying that row operation to that matrix. So in this example, we have a generic matrix A. So I've just filled in letters for the nine entries of this 3x3 three three matrix A. And our elementary matrix E1 from our earlier example. And let's see what happens when we compute E1 times A. We're going to apply our regular row column rule of multiplying these two matrices together. So we take each pair of a row of the first matrix and a column of the second matrix to get the nine entries of the product E times A. And what you can hopefully see is what I talked about before, which is that the result of multiplying E1 times A is in fact the result of applying that row operation, which if you remember from example one, the row operation corresponding to E1 was to replace row 3 by row 3 plus 3 times row 1, and that's exactly what we've done to get this product E1a. And now what we also said earlier is that because our row operations are reversible, our elementary matrices are invertible, and the inverse of an elementary matrix is the elementary matrix corresponding to the reverse row operation. So in this case, we've got an elementary matrix E, which we saw earlier, was the result of scaling row two by a factor of negative four. What would E inverse be? Well, to figure that out, we've got to figure out what the reverse row operation is. So in other words, now we're asking, what row operation would we have to do to get back to the three by three identity matrix? So to do that, we would have to scale row two by a factor of negative one fourth. And that means that the inverse of this elementary matrix is the elementary matrix corresponding to that row operation. So we take that same row operation and apply it to I, and we get the elementary matrix that you see here. And that elementary matrix is in fact the inverse of E. And we can check this. We can multiply E times E inverse and E inverse times E, and both products turn out to be I3 just like we expect. Let's look at another example. So again, we have an elementary matrix E. Remember that this elementary matrix corresponding to the row operation replacing row three by row three plus three times row one. The reverse operation is to replace row three by row three plus negative three times row one. Remember that the reverse operation is what we would have to do to get back to the identity matrix. And the elementary matrix that corresponds to that row operation 
is the result of applying that row operation, that reverse row operation, to i, and that gives us e inverse. And again, we can check by multiplying the original e by this e inverse in either order to verify that we do in fact get i. Okay, so we've seen why elementary matrices are invertible and how to find the inverse of an elementary matrix, but most matrices aren't elementary matrices. So how does this tell us anything about a generic n by n matrix? Well, we've got two theorems here. The first one tells us that an n by n matrix is invertible if and only if the reduced echelon form of A is i n. So in other words, a square matrix is invertible if and only if when we row reduce it to reduced echelon form, we get ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. If we row reduce it and we don't get that, then our matrix is not invertible. And then the second theorem gives us a way to find the actual inverse. It says that any sequence of row operations that takes us from A to I n would also take us from I n to A inverse. We'll talk about that algorithm a little bit later. Let's focus on the first theorem. So the first theorem said that A was invertible if and only if the reduced echelon form of A is I. So that means we've got two things to prove. We're going to start by assuming that A is invertible and try to prove that that means that the reduced echelon form of A is I. So since A is invertible, one of the things that we said about invertible matrices in the previous lecture is that the equation AX equals B has a solution for every vector B. And that means that by the spanning columns theorem, A must have a pivot in every row. But A is a square matrix. So if A has a pivot in every row, then it must also have a pivot in every column. And that means that the reduced echelon form of A is exactly I n. So this proof relies on A being a square matrix. And we talked in lecture 22 about why A has to be square in order for invertibility to make any sense. Now going the other direction, we're assuming that the reduced echelon form of A is I n. And we want to try to understand why does that mean that A is invertible? Well, let's think about the row operations that we have to apply to get from A to I. For each of those row operations, let's construct the elementary matrix E i, so E1, E2, E3, and so on. So E1 is the first row operation that we do on our journey from A to I. E2 is the second row operation on that journey, and so on. So remember that we said that applying a row operation to A is the same as multiplying that matrix A by the corresponding elementary matrix. So after the first row operation, the resulting matrix is E1 times A. After the second row operation, the resulting matrix is E2 times E1 times A and so on. And eventually we get down to ek times ek minus 1 times 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 e1 times a, and that result, according to our assumption, is i sub n. So each of those ei matrices is invertible, and we've talked about in a previous lecture how the product of invertible matrices is invertible. If you remember, the product ab parentheses inverse is b inverse times a inverse. That was something that we talked about in lecture 23. So let's call this product of just the E's, right? So just the E's all multiply together, not with the A there, but just the E's, let's call that B. And we know that that's an invertible matrix because it's a product of invertible matrices. And we know that when we multiply that matrix by A, we get I. So that means that B times A is I sub n. So let's take that equation BA equals I n and multiply both sides on the left by B inverse. Notice that I have to say on the left there because matrix multiplication is not commutative. If I multiply on the right, I might get a different result. So when we multiply on the left, we get B inverse times BA, which we can shift those parentheses since matrix multiplication is associative. On the right, B inverse times IN is just gonna be B inverse. That's because IN is the identity matrix. Now we've got B inverse times B, and that's gonna be the identity matrix. And when we multiply that identity matrix times A, we just get A. So that means that A is B inverse, and that means that B is A inverse, which means that A inverse exists. And in fact, this tells us exactly how to compute A inverse. A inverse is the product of all those E elementary matrices. Now, the other theorem that we talked about earlier said that if we take those row operations that reduced A to I n and apply them to I n, that will transform I n into A inverse. So why is that true? Well, let's keep the same notation from the previous theorem and write E1, E2, and so on for the elementary matrices corresponding to those row operations that reduced A to I n. Now that we know that A inverse is the product of those E's, that means that A inverse is the result of multiplying those elementary matrices by I n, which is the same as applying those row operations to I n. So that proves that second theorem. So this gives us a somewhat bad algorithm for computing A inverse. The process would be to start with our matrix A, row reduce it to i n. If we don't get i n, then our matrix is not invertible. But if we do get i n, 
that we keep careful track of each individual row operation, and then we start over starting with IN and apply those same row operations in that same order, and then the result of that process would be A inverse. So that would work, but it's going to be pretty tedious and, and not very efficient. Here's a better way to do it. We're going to start with what I call a super augmented matrix. We're going to take our matrix A, and instead of augmenting it with a single column, we're going to augment it with an entire other matrix, namely the identity matrix I. So this gives us a double wide matrix. And when we row reduce that matrix, if A row reduces to I, then we get a matrix that looks like I in the left half and A inverse in the second half. And of course, as before, if A doesn't row reduce to I, then A is not invertible. Let's try this algorithm out. Here we have a three by three invertible matrix. So let's see how we can figure out what A inverse is. So we start by constructing that super augmented matrix. So I like to draw a little dotted line here to help me distinguish the two halves of my matrix. So I've got A in the left half and I in the right half. And now we start row reducing. And remember that when we row reduce a matrix using the algorithm that we learned back in lecture five, we start from the left and work from left to right. That means I'm looking at that very first column and thinking about what operation I need to do to get a pivot in my upper left hand corner. That would be a swap to swap row one and row two. And even though I'm only looking at the left half of my matrix to make that decision of what row operation to do, the row operation applies to the entire row, which includes the second half of my matrix. So what I'm doing here is simultaneously applying that row operation to the left half and to the right half of my matrix. So this is why this is a more efficient way to do it. Rather than doing two separate row reductions, I'm doing the two row reductions simultaneously on the two halves of this matrix. So if I continue row reducing in this way, I end up with I in the left half of my matrix. So that means that the reduced echelon form of A was in fact I in this case. And then according to my theorem, the right half of my matrix must be A inverse. And again, we can check here by multiplying A times A inverse in both orders to make sure that we do in fact get I. What about this matrix? Let's try it again. So again, we set up our super augmented matrix with A on the left half and I in the right half, and then we row reduce. But this time, we didn't get I in the left half, which means that this matrix is not invertible. Don't pay any attention to what you get in the right half. That's not the inverse of A. A doesn't have an inverse in this case, and so that's just meaningless garbage. Now, another way to think about what we're doing when we row reduce this super augmented matrix is that we're simultaneously solving the equations ax equals e1, ax equals e2, and so on. And what this means is that the solution of ax equals ei is in fact the ith column of A inverse. Let's look back at our example from earlier and see how this works. So what we have is our super augmented matrix that we row reduced back in example five. And what I've done is instead of row reducing that super augmented matrix, what I've done is separately row reduced regularly augmented matrices. So the first one is the augmented matrix corresponding to the equation AX equals E1. Notice that that fourth column is the standard basis vector E1. And then I've got AX equals E2 and AX equals E3. So I get the same three results here. And those three augmented columns and those three augmented matrices turn out to be the three columns of A inverse. So this is the same result as what we got back when we did example five the first time, but this just illustrates the idea that the individual columns of that inverse matrix are the solutions of the equations AX equals EI for each value of I. And this is useful for solving some problems like this. So let's suppose that we had an invertible four by four matrix that has columns labeled A1 through A4. And let's say that we just happen to know that A1 plus two A2 minus A4 is equal to the standard basis vector E3. How does that help us find the third column of A inverse? Well, what we've just talked about is that the solution of AX equals E3 is that third column of A inverse. So can we think of a way that we, we don't know much about this matrix, but can we think of a way that we could multiply A by some vector to get E3 as a result? Can we think of a solution of the equation AX equals E3? Well, what we know is that AX is a linear combination of the columns of A, and we have a linear combination of the columns of A equaling E3. That's A1 plus 2A2 minus A4 equals E3. And so that means that that's A times the vector 1, 2, 0, negative 1 by the way that we defined a matrix times a vector. And that means that the third column of A inverse is that value of X, is that solution, the vector 1, 2, 0, negative 1. You can just use the minus 1 button on your calculator to find the inverse of a matrix. We have to be a little bit more careful in Wolfram so there's a separate command in Wolfram called inverse. So remember, use a capital I and square brackets. 
If you try to do your matrix raised to the minus one in Wolfram, you're not going to get what you want. It's going to try to take the reciprocal of each entry of your matrix, which is certainly not going to be the inverse of that matrix. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.